Today on the podcast, we talk about all things salt, where this crazy dietary guideline of 2,300 milligrams a day came from, if salt is good or bad for you, and help you make the decision of what is best for your body. You hear all the bull about diet and exercise. Carbs are evil. Do more cardio. Never eat bread or cookies again. Just do a juice cleanse. We get it. We fell for all of the BS too. It's time to go right to the source with the truth about how to live a healthy, sustainable lifestyle. I am Liz. And I'm Becca. We are your nutrition educators, and this is The Food Code. Shake it like a salt shaker, shake it like a salt shaker. Hello. Hello. We are going to be salty AF today with our podcast. Mm -hmm. I love, I I love the impact that salt has made in my life. Let me just say that. We're going to talk a little bit more about exactly what that impact has been for us towards the end, but. Good salt. Good, good salts. Not the salt that they're putting on all your processed foods that we're buying. Actual like salts that provide minerals and benefit to your body. I will tell you there's a total difference between regular salt and all of the colored mineral salts of black salt. I've been adding that to more of our foods, which mm-hmm. is the texture, the taste, the flavor. It's so, so good. If you guys want a good uh, book recommendation, you should listen to, it's called Salt, Acid, Fat, and Heat. Really good book. Um, you can get it on Audible. You can you know purchase it. I would honestly purchase it. I have a hard copy of it because it's got some good recipes and stuff in there. But I also listen to it on Audible. And it's just really powerful. And it's important that we understand why our body needs sodium mm-hmm. and what the minerals do. And you've probably heard us talk a lot about um, our love for LMNT, element. So we wanted to address, you know, why we love it and why it's important and how we've seen a huge shift in our health and energy since starting to take the LMNT packets. And inside the LMNT packets, there's about a thousand milligrams of sodium in the little packet. And so it initially, it's salty. It, your water is salty, but uh, I'll tell you, and Becca can weigh in on her favorite flavors. Watermelon to me tastes like a Jolly Rancher. Mango chili, hands down, still my favorite. Uh, I do like the citrus one sometimes. Kind of reminds me a little bit of a margarita-esque. Mm-hmm. And then the lemon habanero is also good. I haven't tried any of the spicy flavors out of straight fear because I don't like spicy things. Um, <laughs> so I haven't even touched those. I have a couple of them at home. Um, I love the watermelon. I have two, I think it's uh, 30 count boxes of the watermelon at home. And then I have, I love citrus. It's my other favorite. Um, and I do like orange. Orange is pretty good. And I like the raspberry one. I like those pe- that variety pack, but watermelon's by hand, by far my favorite. I'm um, going to venture off and I'm going to try the chocolate as hot chocolate. I have two recipes I found on Pinterest. Chocolate, I put it into a bottle one day and it looked like poop water and I threw the whole thing out because I just couldn't do it. I can do a lot of things. I can taste a lot of things and weird foods and stuff. I think I'm a little more adventurous in that way. But just looking at the brown water, I was like, there's no chance I'm I'm doing this. So I'm going to try it. Um, One of our clients let us know that the hot chocolate is good and I found some recipes on Pinterest. But raise your hand if you are out there listening and you're like, sodium is bad. I avoid Mm -hmm. sodium. Why should we consume sodium? Because thank you to the US government for making us fear salt and demonizing sodium and correlating it in our mind to high blood pressure and poor health. But what's the reality around sodium? Like, What is the truth around sodium? So the US government actually recommends 2.3 grams or 2,300 milligrams. A lot of times on nutrition labels, you'll see it labeled as milligrams. So 2,300 milligrams as like limit, limit it to 2,300 milligrams. And funny fact, the American Heart Association is even lower than that. So they're not even on the same page. Like the American Heart Association, I believe we're going to talk about later, I think it's like 1.4, 1,400 milligrams a day, which is very low salt. Um, All in the name of heart health. The recommendation is largely based on observational data. So there's this guy, a lot of people might know about him. His name was Louis Dahl. So Louis Dahl was around in like the 60s and 70s, and he basically bred two strains of rats that differed in their susceptibility to developing salt-induced hypertension. 
Hypertension is high blood pressure. And these animal models proved that hypertension induced by a high salt diet is influenced by genetic background. His research linked higher sodium to higher blood pressure or in higher blood pressure in certain populations. And as many people know, high blood pressure is basically a very well-known risk factor for heart disease. But this isn't the only research that exists out there, and that's the hard thing. There's a lot of other research that actually shows high salt intakes are linked to lower risk of death and less hypertension. Basically, in the world of research, both sides kind of hold up their research and the argument goes nowhere. Um, So what we have today is going to kind of talk through the importance of salt. It's going to give you both sides of the research. You can kind of decide what seems more logical, what makes more sense. And then also we'll share our personal experience because I think above all else, you guys, research is great, but research is not real life application to you. It is not exactly what is going to happen to you. And you need to experiment with your own body, obviously in safe ways, like, you know, don't be stupid, but experiment in your own way of what feels best. What does your body need the most? And we also need to dive into, you know, why why we think more the right types of sodium is actually better versus less sodium for the majority of people. Um, so we're going to try and provide both sides today and you choose what yes. you think. Absolutely. So what does sodium do in the body? First of all, I think that's really important to understand because sodium is not an optional mineral. Like it is necessary. And at a bare minimum, we need around 500 milligrams or half a gram per day to squeak by if you are extremely low salt, right? Your body goes into sodium sparing mode. So certain hormones kick up and then you pee out less sodium. Thank you to our kidneys. High salt diets have the opposite effect. And the main things that sodium does in the body, which are very, very important, is number one, it regulates fluid balance outside of your cells. So this helps support blood flow. Number two, it conducts nerve impulses in your brain and your nervous system. It also helps maintain healthy blood pressure levels and transport nutrients through your gut. And there's also these things called sodium potassium pumps that occur in your cellular membranes as well. And so we need a good amount of sodium and potassium to be able to pump them in and out of our cells. It's very, very important. But we've gotten this all wrong, I think, for a long period of time because low salt diets have been preached for decades. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's funny because you're mentioning there are certain organizations when I was doing some research on this a few months back and I was looking, you know, at what the organizations say, none of them are in agreement. Mm Mm-mm. No, it's it's all over the board. And so like the American Heart Association, which obviously hypertension is a big deal to the American Heart Association, they are very adamant about keeping sodium as low as possible. But we need to consider, and we're going to kind of talk on this a little bit later on like, it's is it just the salt? Or is it the correlation that salt is in soft drinks and soda salt is in processed foods. Maybe it's not actually the salt. Maybe it's the shit that you're putting in your body that shouldn't be in your body that's causing the high blood pressure, that's and causing the issues. A lot of other chemicals that come in those processed foods, right? We look at sugar, we look at carcinogen, we look at preservatives, a lot of uh, ingredients that we use here in the US that are banned in other countries. Maybe those are the things to actually <laughs> demonize rather than the salt itself. Yep. So like we mentioned before, you know, in comes Lewis Dahl with his research. He was a, he was a research scientist, basically. Um, and he published a bunch of papers in the 60s and 70s. And it wasn't until he got into this salt thing that he became famous. Um, he had the discovery that certain rats with certain genes develop high blood pressure at high salt intakes. And then he found that link between sodium and hypertension in human populations. His data was observational, but he was also confused as to why a lot of people didn't end up with high blood pressure at high salt intakes. Either way, his findings were used basically to help justify the change in the U.S. dietary guidelines that happened in the 80s and kind of this fear mongering to the public to avoid high sodium. Like I said, the American Heart Association is even more aggressive with their salt limiting, advising to standard 1.5 grams a day. I was sorry, I was mistaken. 1,500 milligrams, 1.5. For reference, the average American consumes 3.4 grams, 3,400 milligrams. And I would say the average American is probably consuming this from not great foods, unfortunately. Um, But let's look at some other evidence. Like let's look at, you know, the other side of things. Yep. So why does salt get demonized? Blood pressure. Right. And it makes sense. If I inject you with loads of sodium, it's going to increase your blood volume and therefore increase your blood pressure. But what about normal variations in dietary sodium intake? 
how does that actually affect our blood pressure? Well, the data is inconsistent. There have been studies like an inner salt study, which looked at sodium and blood pressure connection over 10,000 people and across dozens of regions all over the world. And they concluded in the majority of them that there was no link between salt and hypertension. It's a pretty big study, right? Mm -hmm. Several studies coming together over 10,000 people across dozens of regions over the world. No link between salt and hypertension hypertension. So since this study, evidence for sodium causing high blood pressure continues to underwhelm. In 2017, research analyzed 2,632 people with normal blood pressure consuming either low under 2.5 grams or high over 2.5 grams sodium intake. And guess what? The high sodium group had lower blood pressure than the salt restrictors. This simply can't happen if more sodium is always meant to lead to higher blood pressure, right? So again, you're, you've got two big studies here. One is inconclusive in terms of hypertension, and the other one shows that high sodium actually leads to lower blood pressure. Make mm-hmm. it make sense. I know. And that's, that's why you have to evaluate. There's always two sides to the coin, guys. Research, believe it or not, is often funded too by a lot of people that have profit in the game. So just take research with a grain of salt, okay? You got to kind of dig a little bit deeper sometimes. And the other piece that a lot of times is not mentioned is potassium. So potassium is another electrolyte, a very important electrolyte, especially when it comes to its relationship with sodium. So a subset of the population are genetically prone to hypertension and high salt intakes. We already mentioned that. We call these people sodium hyper responders. So there are certain people and their data is kind of intermingled with everyone else's likely driving a lot of these positive correlations of sodium intake and high blood pressure. So should salt sensitive people avoid salt? Not necessarily. They may do better to increase potassium because when potassium is at the proper level, it balances the salt properly. When sodium is really high, like in processed foods and really low with potassium because potassium typically isn't in processed foods, it's in a fruits and vegetables, we end up with this really big imbalance of too high of sodium, too low of potassium. And when salt sensitive people actually get enough potassium, it neutralizes the effect of sodium on blood pressure. This effect also occurs to a lesser extent in the rest of the population. So inadequate potassium could explain some of the links between high sodium and hypertension. High sodium diets tend to be full of refined foods, guys, like I just said, which typically don't have potassium in them. So we end up in this conundrum. And people eating more sodium tend to consume more soft drinks, tend to consume more sodium-laden beverages. We know soft drinks cause obesity. Obesity drives hypertension. So maybe it's not the sodium. Maybe we need to just give sodium a break and stop being so mean to it because I don't think that it's the real problem. Yeah. Funny story. The other day uh, I was shopping. No, I was at the in fun flatables park with Marcus and he wanted ice cream and I was like, Oh, you know, I brought my water in, but like, I kind of want something cold and they had diet soda. We had diet Coke at your house on Saturday Mm -hmm. and this was a diet Pepsi. Dude, I threw it away. It tastes so So, chemical. mm -hmm. I'm like, I just can't do this. I really can't do any kind of soda or diet soda or anything anymore because it just tastes all the chemicals in there. But anywho, (laughs) random fact. Mm -hmm. So does low sodium actually help your heart? Well, the case here is kind of, um, tenuous at best, right? Even if we buy into the argument for a moment that low sodium diets will help our heart, what about the outcomes that really matter? Does low sodium actually prevent heart attacks, strokes, and cardiac health? In my opinion, the best way to answer this is, you know, to share another study here Mm -hmm. because I think this is important. Researchers um, from the American Medical Association followed 4,700 individuals with heart disease over several years, and they routinely measured their sodium excretion. Okay, so your kidneys filter all of these things out. It gets excreted um, into your urine, so they were measuring that uh, through their urine. And when the study came to a conclusion, they found that 2,057 of the patients had died from stroke, heart attack, and other cardiac-related deaths. Researchers then plotted the risk of death data against sodium intake data. And what they found is that the lowest risk of death aligns with about five grams of sodium per day. That's 5,000 milligrams of sodium per day. So the lower sodium intakes and the death risk shoots up. So at least according to this data, low sodium diets do not 
appear to improve heart health. But there's still massive, you know, confusion on this point because again, the USDA, the American Heart Association, all of these organizations, federal organizations don't agree and cannot come to a conclusion on what is the proper amount of sodium. Mm -hmm. And I don't believe in any of the research that I did one time did I see them talk about processed foods compared to actual mineral salts, right? They're just talking about sodium in general blanket statement. That's totally different when you're talking about pink Himalayan sea salt, gray salt, black salt, right? All of these really great salts that you can get from the earth. They're talking about uh, just your typical white table salt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And here's the thing that people need to understand is like going low sodium can actually be detrimental to your health. Like Liz was saying in the beginning, sodium is not an optional mineral. Your body needs sodium. It needs electrolytes. When you restrict salt, your kidneys go into the sodium sparing mode. In other words, you pee out less sodium. Think of it kind of like, you know, your body rationing the sodium. When sodium is scarce, you save some for later. Your body's smart. Preserving sodium, however, comes with consequences. Namely, flood of hormones, aldosterone, renin, norepinephrine, with potentially undesirable effects, okay? So both renin and aldosterone raise blood pressure. Norepinephrine isn't a bad hormone per se, but it helps get you going. So norepinephrine is part of the stress response and boosts levels of the blood pressure spiking renin. So all of these things are important to help raise blood pressure, which we need to have at a certain level, because without enough sodium, with too much stress on the body, our adrenal basically our adrenals are required to help raise blood pressure in the morning. The adrenals need sodium to help do this. When the adrenals are taxed from too much stress in your life, not enough sleep, too much exercise, not enough food, not enough nourishment, whatever it is, the adrenals kind of burn out to an extent. Sodium is very helpful with getting them back to a place where they can provide that stimulus in the morning to help raise blood pressure. All of these hormones need to work. But the bigger danger of low-sodium diets, they, ris- they increase the risk of low blood serum sodium, which is known as hyponatremia. This can cause muscle cramps, fatigue, seizures, confusion, brain damage, and in severe cases, death. So this is something that I think a lot of people need to realize. If you're eating more whole unprocessed foods, you likely, or especially if you're eating a low-carb diet, you are likely not getting enough sodium from your food. Natural occurring foods don't have a ton of sodium in them unless you're like really aggressively shaking the salt shaker. And even then, you're probably not getting, you know, this amount that seems to correlate a little bit more with like an adequate health level. And so we need to understand if you are sweating frequently, if you're an athlete, and if you are low carb, low calorie, or all whole unprocessed foods, you are not getting enough sodium from your food. And you can end up with maybe not seizures or brain damage, but something that Liz and I both experienced for a long time is like fatigue. Mm -hmm. I was just exhausted. And I thought, you know, maybe I'm just not sleeping well. Maybe I'm just not like, you know, I have a new baby. Maybe I'm just really busy. Mm-hmm. No, I've seen a huge change in my energy level since taking the salt every day. I have too. And I'll say that I don't crave things the way that I used to. Like I used to have random days where I'd want sweets or I'd want, you know, just something salty, like crunchy. I don't crave that anymore at mm-hmm. all. Um, in fact, it doesn't even like taste good to me anymore. And so from my end, you know, I drink my salt usually in the morning. If for some reason, you know, I don't because I'm just out the door too quick or whatever, um, I will have it like mid afternoon. I use it kind of, you know, just any time that I need a little bit of boost in energy. But I have completely stepped away from any type of pre workout. I used to wake up and I would have half a cup of coffee and I would also take a scoop of pre workout dry, chug it, and go to the gym. Like, <laughs> <laughs> to get me going in the morning. My husband takes pre-workout dry, I think two to three times a day. So I'm getting him on the salt train, especially because he's doing more of a carnivore uh, approach right now with his intake. And so he's cutting out basically all carbs besides fruit. So it's really, really important depending upon the types of foods that you consume and the lifestyle that you live. If you're active and you're sweating a lot, we lose lots of sodium through sweat. And so here's where we have an increased need for sodium, right? Relative to someone who is sedentary and they're not, you know, sweating four or five, six days a week. Athletes, anybody who sits in a sauna, you need to replenish your sodium. And I would do it right after you leave that sauna. So sometimes, you know, when I'm at the gym and I finish my workout in the sauna, I'll come home and I have my element tea right after, or I finish my element tea. Cause I put it in to a tumbler that's about 32 ounces. It is, you know, salty. Again, it's got a thousand milligrams of sodium, 200 milligrams of potassium and 60 milligrams of magnesium. So I know it's really important depending upon your lifestyle, what you're eating, 
If you're on a low carb diet, like Becca said, if you're just eating, you know, one ingredient foods that don't have a lot of preservatives and sodium in them naturally, you need to add LMNT or some sort of electrolytes into your day. You could also do pink Himalayan sea salt in the morning and water with a little bit of lemon juice or something. I don't think that tastes as good as, you know, the LMNT. So that's kind of, you know, our experience with it. And what I would say is that you as an individual, I don't know anything about you. So I can't necessarily say this is right or wrong for you, but I would experiment. I would test, I would try, and I would see how you feel with it. One of the things we tell our clients when they start it is to start with a half a packet, Mm -hmm. get used to it. You're going to fall in love with it. I guarantee it. (laughs) Almost every client that we've had, you know, get the sample pack. They're like, oh my God, this is so good. I can't believe the energy that I have. And like, I'm not craving things anymore. And it's just amazing. Muscle cramps too. I have a client that was having like restless leg syndrome in the middle of the night. All that's gone away. Yeah. So some dehydration symptoms and you guys, a lot of people think dehydration is in like you're about to pass out. That's like extreme dehydration. So dehydration symptoms are constant thirst, even if you're drinking a lot of water, which I'll explain in a second. Dry skin and lips, dark urine, obviously. I think too much water also, increasing that like overabundance of hydration, that's not helping either. When people have clear pee, that's not a good sign. That means you are diluting your electrolyte levels. You do not want clear pee. Muscle cramps, mood and memory disruptions, headaches, fatigue, constipation, too low of blood pressure, nausea, all of these things are actually really, really um, big signs that a lot of people don't think are dehydration. And so here's the problem. Most people that hold like eight glasses of water a day, believe it or not, has basically zero evidence to back it up, although it's like praised everywhere in all types of different offices and stuff. So the evidence says that drinking too much water is actually the real problem. So a lot of people are like, well, I drink a gallon of water a day, but I'm constantly thirsty. It's probably because you are not consuming enough sodium or electrolytes to actually maintain your hydration. And so you're driving this dehydration state because you are peeing out all of the things that you should be keeping in your body. You're diluting your body's electrolyte levels. So do not think that drinking too much water is good because it decreases blood sodium levels. That's what they actually warn a lot of athletes against to avoid, like especially elite endurance athletes, to avoid hyponatremia. So don't think that your gallon of water a day is actually a great idea either unless you're consuming enough sodium to help your body keep good blood sodium levels. Yeah, I I honestly have come back um, around the corner in terms of the gallon a day. Like, you know, there's a lot of ways that you can look at water intake. Some individuals, like I personally shoot for about three liters of water. It's about 96. And the reason I do that is because one, I'm active. I walk a lot. I also go to the gym and I sweat at least five, six days a week. And two, I just feel better with that, especially with having my element tea packet and at least one of my leaders. Now for other individuals, depending upon the stage of life that they're in, your fluid needs vary right? Like if you're doing a lot of foods that contain water, let's say leafy greens, watermelon, other fruits that, you know, do have some natural water sources, and you can count a little bit of that. But if you're sweating and you're active and you're only drinking like 40 ounces of water a day, guys, you're doing yourself a disservice. Water is the most important nutrient in the body. And guys, it is the easiest thing (laughs) You can pick up a glass of water right now. You guys have heard me rant about this before. It gets under my skin when you know we look at the signs of dehydration, early dehydration, chronic dehydration. This stuff gets serious. Low water intake, the number one sign that you're not drinking enough water is fatigue. But then we look at things like colitis and constipation. Both of those are tied to chronic dehydration. It's an easy fix. Yet most people say, well, I don't like the taste of water or I just keep forgetting or I have to pee. Well, guess what? When you're adding salt and you're actually getting minerals into your body, your body is going to utilize that water as kind of like the lubricant to your body. It's going to be able to get it in and out of cells. It's going to be able to lubricate your joints and your muscles and do the things that it's meant to do. So if you find that you know, you're peeing a lot, adding sodium to your water can also help. And so it just, it's a big game changer. And I think everybody's needs are very bio individual in terms of the overall water consumption as a general baseline from some of the research that I have uh, been doing the last four or five months. What I found is anywhere between like 72 and 77 ounces is kind of a good range for the average woman. Outliers of that are going to be, you know, if you sweat and if you, you know, have a lot of um, stress in your life, then maybe you need a little bit more or you eat a lot of processed foods and you don't have a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables that have some hydration in them. So take all those things into account. But at the end of the day, I would say a baseline for any just middle aged woman, anywhere between 72 and 77 ounces of water 
is a good start. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You can always use like the half your body weight in ounces, but you need to, you need to probably have a better balance between adequate, good sodium, potassium and water in your life and see how it impacts not only your energy, but your workouts too. My workouts have felt way better. So hopefully today made you think a little bit, made you question. That's what we're all about. We want you to make your own informed decisions with your health, with your choices and what you put in your body. So hopefully today helped you be a little bit more informed. Thank you for listening to The Food Code. If this episode resonated with you, please share, rate and review as this helps us reach others around the world. With that, thank you for listening. We'll be back soon. Love you guys.